was the summer of 2014, and for my son's bar mitzvah present, just like many Jewish parents, we wanted him to bond with the Holy Land. Oh, it worked perhaps too well. My husband had stayed back at the hotel, and our friends, my son and I, had just stopped in a pharmacy. Run! Run to the bomb shelter, sweetie! Please! Please hurry! I didn't hear the sirens at first, but the Israelis did. They're used to hearing these things. We ran to the back of the storeroom. It was a 12 foot by 24 foot windowless bomb shelter. My heart's pounding. Boom! Boom! I hear it and feel the percussion of the exploding bombs. I'm trying not to get sick. I look at my 13 year old son and I think I'll never forgive myself if something happens to him. That's an excerpt from a speech I gave to the Orange County Jewish Bar Association. It was the first but not the last time we had to run to a bomb shelter. Our adventure and my transformation is also the subject of my book, Blasted from Complacency, A Journey from Terror to Transformation in Israel. There is no chapter in a parenting book on what to do when a war starts and you're on a family vacation. Think touring extraordinary and sacred sites mixed with cowering in bomb shelters. I'm still trying to get over the Jewish guilt of taking my son to war for his bar mitzvah present. The impact of being human targets helped me understand the plight of Israelis living like this, and it also made me want to work on peace. How Israel is often described on the news is not what I'd seen with my own eyes. And I felt Palestinian parents also preferred their children playing safely in their backyards. The missiles exploded just near enough to blow apart my world as I knew it, forever changing me. And you'd never recognize my life today with what it was like then. I believe I found my life's purpose. Hello, I'm Penny ST and I'm the host of Peace with Penny. Today we will be speaking with Reverend Canon Nicholas T. Porter, Executive Director of Jerusalem Peace Builders. Father Nicholas is the Founder and Executive Director of Jerusalem Peace Builders. A longtime resident of Europe and Middle East, he is an educator and Episcopal priest. His academic credentials include BA in Soviet and Middle Eastern Studies from Yale, MA in Middle Eastern Studies from the American University in Cairo, MA in War Studies from the University of London, and an MA in Divinity or Theology from Yale University. Jerusalem Peace Builders' vision is a Jerusalem and a world where Jews, Christians, Muslims, and Druze live together as sisters and brothers in dignity, equality, and peace. Jerusalem Peace Builders, or JPB, is an interfaith nonprofit organization with a mission to create a better future for humanity across religions, cultures, and nationalities. In a world to that mission is the belief that the future of Jerusalem is the future of the world. To that end, JPB promotes transformational person-to-person -person encounters among the peoples of Jerusalem, Israel, Palestine, and the United States. They have many enlightening programs, bringing together Israeli, Palestinian, and American teens and young adults together in the United States, Israel, and in the Palestinian territories in summer camps, leadership programs, four-year programs of conflict resolution in high schools in Israel, and adult programs of travel, educator training, and a new program for empowering women. They are creating peace builders by providing them necessary skills to change the paradigm in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and create a better world. Peace with Penny is excited to show our audience another organization of peacemakers working hard to provide skills to the next generation to improve their lives and others and hopefully change their fate from destruction to one of peace. Welcome, Father Nicholas. Well, thank you, Penny, and thank you for that gracious uh, uh, introduction. I'm delighted to be with you here today and be able to share about the work of Jerusalem Peace Builders, how it really uh, involves education, uh, life change, uh, friendship, and, and, and our spirits as well. I'm just delighted to be here. Thank you for having me. 
I'm thrilled to have you here. I thought we'd start with, you have a, a terrific clip. So um, let's, let's start with that. I'm meeting the rest of the campers from the Jerusalem Peace Builders. I'm actually looking forward to, to, to see how uh, this workshop might change how we think about many issues. If they, if they hear things on the news, if they hear things from others, they know how to think critically and they know that other people might not necessarily be wrong and they might not necessarily be 100% correct. So essentially the skills that they learn in the camp, how to communicate with other people, hopefully that translates into them using it later on in life. We all, we all have this morality, we all have these common things, and we basically know different truths, but that's the thing, we can get to know each other's truths and understand what other people think. I just prayed with Marcel and Ismail at the mosque. I've been to other mosques before, but I've never actually joined in prayer. So that was very interesting. I very much enjoyed it. I've been to a few mosques, but I've never felt as welcome as I did today. So Judaism is a faith, Judaism is a people, and Judaism, one more level, is a heritage, because we share the same history. Before we're trying to, to, to reach peace, and somehow, we must have uh, detected this is the trust building method. You build trust from just getting to know people. Uh, if I get to know people, I can trust them, I can be vulnerable with them. We are from Leaps of Faith. We are from a priest, rabbi, and an imam. We are from bonding, from peace, through friendships. We are from a world full of conflict, but we are a world trying to stop it. We are made of love, warm fuzzies, and family time. We are from breaking barriers, from taking down every single stereotype we have. We are from memories that will last forever. We are from four families coming into one. We all have a lot of identities that we can work together and see common ground on. But when we have an identity that is sort of our victim identity, the identity that we feel oppressed by, that one seems to take over a lot more thought in our brains. It takes up a lot of space. And when, when that takes up a lot of space, we forget about the other identities that we have, the other ways in which we can connect to other people. Because of this program and others before it, I learned to see from other perspective. Not only did you change each other and come together as a family, but my, my pocket, my leg has been buzzing all day from people that you have impacted. People from Palmer, people from the synagogue, people from the mosque. I want you to feel powerful. I want you to feel like you can make a difference because you've already made a difference and you haven't even gone home yet. We are. We are. We are. JPB. Jerusalem Peace Builders.
And as we say in Texas, that's all, folks. That's all, folks. I love that. Now, we'll st- I, I have to say, I, I do listen to that just because I like it. <laughs> it, it. It's very inspiring. Isn't it? Isn't um, it great for me to be able to see a lot of those young people again whom I've known over the years and uh, get to see their faces? So many of them have gone on to be medical students and lawyers and officers in the army and all kinds of things so it's wonderful to see their faces when they were young that's really exciting um so how would you describe jerusalem peace builders that's a big question penny but i'll see if i can give you a nice nugget that is easy to remember Jerusalem Peace Builders is a nonprofit uh, interfaith organization that focuses on peace and leadership education in the Holy Lands. And that's plural on purpose, lands with an S. So that uh, captures both the plurality of the lands but also the visions in them. And uh, to do that, I think, as you know very well, uh, you need some outside actors as well. So we're, we're, we're proud to always include an American component in that, American Jews, American Christians, American Muslims, as they learn from the, literally their sisters and brothers in the Middle East about peace building, about leadership, about transforming our world. And, uh, you know, we believe that Jerusalem is the center of the world. We believe it's a a bellwether, a weather vane for uh, human relationships as well as uh, uh, the future. Uh, And That means that's where we have to start. That's where we have our call to do our work, just as you felt your call there uh, in 2014. And, uh, you know, it just becomes inescapable for some people. And- (laughs) Boy, isn't that the truth. (laughs) It is. And, and, you know, we, we believe that the path to peace does not go through politicians. I think we've all been disappointed there time and again from any number of politicians, from any number of parties and religions and viewpoints and ethnicities. Uh, The path to peace runs through people and changed personhood, changed self-perception, changed perception of others, a changed personal narrative, uh, a a changed narrative. And so that's really where we're working. That's why we focus on peace and educational programs that focus on individuals and uh, individuals aggregating into cohorts and cohorts aggregating into something else you know we're we're big fans of count leo tolstoy's uh very famous quote which is everybody wants to change the world but nobody wants to change themselves you know he was on to something which is to change the world you must change yourself that's your starting point because you're part of the world and and that's we're proud. We're proud to participate from that level on up. I totally agree, and and also realize if you don't change yourself, you can't bring that out into the world. It it starts. It's not a selfish thing. It is just a fact of life. You have to change yourself first. Um, you work together with your wife, and where did this family dream? come from and how did Jerusalem Peace Builder evolve into the organization it is today? 
Yes, indeed, I do work with my wife, Dorothy. Uh, we're college sweethearts. And yeah. the work uh, began soon after we got married. Uh, we lived in Jerusalem for about three years. And we were working uh, with the Episcopal Church there, but primarily with supporting uh, a network of hospitals and schools and orphanages and training centers. And we, 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 we saw in that really the building blocks of peace. And when we ended up moving to Paris after that time, we left with the dream of what Jerusalem Peace Builders was. And what that, year was that? That, well, that was in 1997 when we sort of had that moment and we dined out on that dream for a long time, Penny, before we really had the courage to take the next step. You know, we stayed in touch with Jerusalem. We led lots of groups and pilgrimages and visits there. We raised money for all those hospitals and schools and things mm -hmm. that uh, I talked about earlier. But... Mm -hmm. We, we, we were scared, we were scared. We were scared about the changes we'd have to make and would we succeed? And then we finally you know, took that leap. Yes, it was a leap of faith, it was. And very quickly, you know, our two best friends from college joined us. How cool. Yeah. Absolutely. And then suddenly it wasn't scary because we were just family mm -hmm. and friends. Nice. And that, nice. That's been our model the whole time is that the way we or, you know, shaped the organization, shaped the staff, shaped the programming and our relationships, whether it's with teenagers or teachers or people on a pilgrimage. Uh, and I hope with the women's empowerment group, that we're family <laughs> and, and, and that wonderful uh, video clip you showed, one of the young people talks about going from, you know, four families to one family, right? Yeah. Be able to get over all our divisions and reach that kind of unity that is a essential, a fluid kind of unity that's essential to peace. So we, we, we made that jump in 2011 we, in 2011, I can remember, we ran one program and we could only convince 11 kids to participate. Mm -hmm. Last year, we worked with about 3,000 people and we have, uh, we're planning to uh, have six programs this summer with about 150 people participating. And we had to turn away maybe two or three people for every slot. Oh, what a shame. What a, it shame. Is a shame. It is a shame. But you know, one of the things, and, and I, I certainly wish we could accommodate everyone, but we know the bigger you get, the more demand there is, right? Mm -hmm. uh, which is, you know, leads me to, you know, two other pieces of this, which is, you know, we do this in partnership with others. Mm -hmm. We do this in partnership with uh, American, Israeli, and Palestinian organizations. Mm -hmm. And you know, we, we, you know, the way we do this is we want them to grow not just up alongside us, but go beyond us, right? And that they're mm -hmm. developing the capacities to to do this with and alongside us, but also with each other right? Exactly. Uh, yes. We have no delusions of grandeur. You know, mm -hmm. we can't fix this conflict. Mm -hmm. But what we certainly can do is contribute leadership, understanding, prayer, and experience towards its solution. And that we're proud of. And we know we, we know that works. So that's where we that's how we operate. That's how we operate. That's so great. Do you know how many people have participated over the years? 
Yes. I mean, thousands. Yeah. So we, I believe we <clears throat> are around 14,000 people have, have been involved in one or another of our program. And I want to be clear, mm -hmm. we do lots with adults that mm -hmm. uh, doesn't get as much attention as the young people, right? You know, you watch that video right. you showed and you fall in love with it, but you know, right. we do a lot of work with adults as well. Yeah, well, we're going to get to those too. Sure. That's, that's for sure. sure. And and a lot of what you do is, is you know, train teachers as well to teach the young and it just has such a um, unfolding kind of like a beautiful garden effect of of peacemakers i i, I just love it I well just we try to design it all to be a sphere so mm -hmm. that every program leads to supporting other programs that we run so everything's interconnected so if you do well in one area it's going to have impact in another and uh, that's that unfolding that you talk about um so i suspect part of the reason that you have to turn away people is is funding and but i, I so I'm, I'm wondering how do you get funded and and how would people donate if they would want to sure so uh we're, we're, we welcome all donations. Uh, we're a registered 501c3 organization. You can donate very easily by going to our website, uh, which is jerusalempeacebuilders.org. And there is a giving page there. You can, uh, give, you can do PayPal. You can give by credit card. It gives you the address if you like to send a check. Uh, and uh, so our funding primarily comes, when I mean primarily, I mean sort of 98% comes from motivated individuals like yourself, Penny. And, and I'm sure like your audience for these great podcasts. Uh, and so from individuals, uh, small organizations, and small foundations. And they provide us with the vast bulk of our, our, our budget every year. Uh, we've got a very lean budget. We're able to do that because we're all practitioners. That's kind of a technical term. That means we all teach and we all do some admin and just about everything else in between. Uh, we don't have any infrastructure. We don't own any buildings. We don't have office rents, it all goes to support program, which is why we're able to do a lot with a little. And yes, donations allow us to do more. And Wonderful. That's how we get that done. That's how we get that done. I always like to talk a little personally, if you, if you don't mind, because um, as you know, um, it's not like I'm some big organization or this, you know, I was, uh, I had a corporate background and all that, but um, since I had my kid, I, I was a stay at home mom when all this happened to me and, and uh, do all this, <laughs> you know, from home. And I want people to know you don't have, you can be a common person and do whatever it is your talents afford you to do. And um, so I'm curious, um, where were you born and raised? Sure. So I was born in New York City and New York Hospital. I am a real New Yorker. I'm one, <laughs> one of, I don't, I don't want to say the few because there's a number of us out there, but you know, that it doesn't get any more New York than uh, New York Hospital. And you don't have much accent. <laughs> I, I don't because uh, when I was in about uh, first grade, my parents moved out to Kansas City, Missouri. Uh, ah. and we lived on a big cattle farm. And then uh, at, the, at the right moment, I went, I went back east to go to school and met my wife at Yale College, as well as my good friends, our good friends, Stuart and Angie Kenjinger, who joined us uh, in the, the founding of Jerusalem Peace Builders. 
and uh, worked in New York for a while and then headed off to the Middle East uh, where I got some of those degrees that you were kind enough to mention, but that's also where I got, where I really fell in love with Jerusalem, got seduced by Jerusalem. Yeah. And, um, there is such a feeling when you go there. There's, it's just such, uh, so deep historically and ethnically, and uh, it, it's, it is a whole world there. Oh, it is. It is. And, uh, you know, it was really on one of the visits. I used to live in Egypt for a time, and it was on one of the visits up there. I met my father in Jerusalem. Well, actually, he came to, he came to Cairo, and we went up to Jerusalem together. He'd never been to the Middle East, ever. Mm. And uh, so it was his first time. And uh, we were in Jerusalem. We were in the Church of the Resurrection, Church of the Holy Sepulchre. That's a very mm -hmm. special place for Christians where we remember uh, Jesus's death and, and resurrection. And it's a beautiful, I, I, beautiful I, building. It's beautiful. It's old. It's got all kinds of complicated usage and histories, which can be off putting. But we were in there and we just had one of those moments that we all know. Uh, no matter what our background is, where everything seems so clear. Mm. And that clarity spoke to me and said, this is going to be the focus of your life. Wow. What's your ethnic background? So uh, my ethnic background is, is like many people's, uh, a little of this and a little of that. <laughs> so my mom's family are uh, Greeks and Syrian, okay, a Greek mm -hmm. Orthodox. And my dad's family are English and German. So ah. we got a little bit of everybody in us. Uh, and I, I hope that makes me a little more empathetic, right? I hope that makes me feel more empathetic. And today, where do you live and how often do you go to the Middle East? So I live in Brattleboro, Vermont, the, the, oh. the, the Green Mountain State, and uh, have done that since about 2013. And until COVID, I went over to Jerusalem probably four times a year. I spent about a third mm -hmm. or a quarter of the year there. And um, but since COVID, I haven't been. I'm looking forward to going over on the in the middle of of well a little more towards the end of april it will be my first time back in over two years i'm i'm completely overexcited can barely sit for this uh podcast mm -hmm. <laughs> i'll be there for two weeks i can't wait to get back there and and do you have kids and did they attend your camps oh yeah so uh, dorothy and i are blessed with three beautiful daughters they're all young adults now, and all three of them have participated in the programs. All three of them have been to Jerusalem. Uh, I think all three of them have also been to Jordan and some other places uh, in the Eastern Mediterranean. And um, they're, they're, they're all in as well. One of my daughters will be working at one of the summer, summer camps in Houston this summer. And great, and how old is she now? She is 20 years of age. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. So did you grow up with an interest in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict at all, or? None at all. Just at all. this all happened later? As... Well, I'll tell you, it, there was a little inkling. Mm. So I can remember uh, this was not something that was part of our household or anything like that. and. Mm -hmm. Um, but I do remember as a, a, a boy, uh, would have been an eight year old boy, eight, nine year old boy sitting on our kitchen counter when we lived on the farm in Kansas City, north of Kansas City, out in the countryside. 
uh, watching clips of Walter Cronkite, CBS News, of yeah. October 73, Arab-Israeli War. Oh, yeah. I can remember sitting on that counter. I could take you to the very spot. And I remember looking at that, those clips and thinking, there's something really wrong here. And as a little kid, I was like, I want to help fix it. Yeah. That got lost. That got lost for basically 20 years. And then that, that came back up. You had to learn some skills. Had to learn some skills, had to get a, get a few gray hairs, get a little gray beard going, you know? Uh, <laughs> right. So uh, in a segment of your programs, you have a series of summer camps and, and it's, based on a system of summer camps and can you explain about how you built that and and afterwards we'll get into more details and see some pictures but sure I'd love to love to and you know I think this goes to your point uh that anybody you don't have to be a specialist to make a difference so you know in my case I was and am a specialist in the Middle East but Mm -hmm. You know, we started, I didn't know anything about, I knew a lot of people in the Middle East, knew a lot about the Middle I didn't know anything about the camp. And I didn't even go to summer camp as a kid. Yeah. And I grew up on a farm. You don't need a camp if you live on a farm. <laughs> camp farm is kids. Right? Yeah. So what we did is we started with the, uh, the leadership program. So for older teens. Mm. And then we quickly realized that, you know, that's not enough. That's like going to your senior year in high school and saying that's enough. Well, mm -hmm. it's not. So then we, we went backwards and we started a program for sophomore aged teenagers. And then, you know, then you start filling the gaps again and again and again. And the next thing we knew, we had a four year program. And that was really the genius of one of my colleagues. His name is Jack Karn. He runs our programs down in Houston, Texas for us, which is uh, really where our American hub is. And uh, it's a four year sequential program. And those four year programs, so after your freshman, sophomore, junior, senior year, and that, that camp program really parallels and brings out the best of our in-school program. By in-school, I mean that in, in, in different parts of the United States and in schools in the Holy Lands, we run classes in schools. Right? Yeah, yeah. And, uh, from those classes, sometimes a school has us come and do a day. Sometimes a school has us come do you know, an hour and a half for 12 weeks, right? I mean, they're all different sort of shapes and sizes, but out of those programs come the young people who join those summer, the four-year summer program. And uh, we're, we're blessed with a very high rate of retention. So we are over 90% of young people who start with us finish. <clears throat> Wow, that sounds just huge. It, it is huge. You know, a little bit, some of that was that some of those numbers were disrupted by COVID. Oh, sure, sure. Everything uh, was. going into COVID and what we're seeing uh, in our admissions this year for this summer, uh, it, it's around 90%. And what we did is we've actually decided to double up one of our programs because we just said, you know, what? Why don't we just let you know admit this whole other set of of, of first timers, uh, because it's time to grow. It's time to grow. It's time to give them a chance. I don't suppose I could talk you into thinking I'm 14. <laughs> it sounds like such a fun experience, such and a learning experience. Well, that's it, and I think that's the the genius of, of new kind of the new educational approach, experiential learning. 
which yeah. is you're learning rather than being taught and you uh you you play to learn yeah and this is one of the keys of helping young people get over all these uh you might say collective narratives mm -hmm. that want to divide them from each other you yeah know, can connect and you might say and play in the sort of biggest sense of that word and right suddenly once they, they in, in play you develop trust and once mm -hmm. we have trust we get to friendship and then we can start talking about that yeah i'd like to uh, get into um first the um uh one of well, your your actual starting point with yeah, the that's Voyager. That's right. That's down in Houston, Texas, at Camp Allen. One yeah, of if you could talk about some of these pictures, I know that you know you're you've talked a little bit about what are what are the, what are the opportunities here? Sure. So Camp Allen, which is a camp of the Episcopal Diocese of Texas a beautiful facility in, in, in terms of sort of church camps. It's probably the premier church camp in the United States. Uh, so uh, bringing the young people here, a key part of peace building for young people or adults, but we're talking about young people, is getting them out of their home context so that they can grow. They're not being confined. They're not kept in a, in a pigeonhole, right? So they come here, and for many of them, they've never been to any environment like this in their whole life. And so uh, it's co-ed, it's interfaith, it's co-ed, you know, there's boys dorms and girls dorms and all that kind of thing. It's all, you know, kosher food. It's all you know, supervised and, 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 and comfortable so that they can enjoy the difference of living together, right? Christians, Muslim, Jews living together uh, in, in a dorm, probably never done that before. Been in a big, big outdoorsy kind of place like this, probably haven't done it before. And then you can see the fun things they're doing. If you look at the, uh, the, the, the photo uh, to the lower right where someone has a red handkerchief on there, they're doing mm -hmm. trust building exercises. Mm -hmm. okay? uh, in um, you know, they're, they're, they're getting over their fears and horseback riding. Most of them have never even touched a horse before. Uh, and uh, very few of them have ever canoed before. You can see the effect of that. There's some joy going on. Then uh, uh, out on the lake there. So playing, play being a key part of this. This is Voyager. This is level one. This is after your freshman year. In you now you 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 actually have is Jewish Israelis and and uh, Palestinians and uh, American kids here that's, together, that's all, right? That's all. That's all who's moved in to that that center photo there, and mm -hmm. you can't tell them apart, can you? Of course not. You can't tell them apart. And in fact, the photo uh, of the, the three young women, that's a, uh, a, a, a Christian, a Muslim, and a Jew from, from the Holy Lands right there, looking like sisters of Abraham, exactly who they are. So this is Voyager, Penny. This is, this is the introduction. This is the let's get to know ourselves and each other. Right. And, and you you're you're also teaching things like uh, group dialogue and identity training. And yeah, that's that identity training is really happens a lot in the Voyager. It runs through all of them. But identity training, knowing who you are, you know, who, who your neighbor is, who you are together. That's really the, the primary focus of Voyager and all these activities you see here uh, can both make that happen and reinforce it, propel it along, fuel it. Mm 
You've got Israelis and Palestinians, most probably for the first time, you know, in Israel, they live right next to each other, but there's not a social interaction. Yeah. Now, all of a sudden, they're there, and they're together, and each has all of these perceptions of the other. Yep. yep. How do you deal with that? And, and what's, what is, I'm interested what it's like in the beginning and what it's like at the end of camp. And camp lasts what 10 days or two weeks or somewhere between that? 10 days and two weeks that voyager is more yeah. 10 days because they're mm -hmm. young kids they're uh -huh. 14 year olds right and so, away for the first time and, yeah, and and that's is hard on mom and dad is it yeah is it? so yeah yeah i want to get to the parents too <laughs> who are these parents who send israeli and palestinian kids to a okay. camp to be together but anyway well, so i'll tell you who they are in brief they're very courageous parents who yeah who have the same dream as you and i do mm -hmm. right? a dream akin to ours which is a dream of peace a dream, mm -hmm. of, liberty, a dream of a future better than the present yeah and um so uh so in the beginning okay they're in, getting in off the, the buses in the beginning we, you know they, we, they, we've done some work with them right before oh. they arrive oh okay so, so remember we've been in the schools we've been in the schools right so brought them together a few times before they even get to camp all right ah. don't underestimate okay. the awkwardness of a 14 year old boy all right so in the well, beginning, you know or the relief of the parents i guess when i think of a teenager sending them away for a while absolutely <laughs> teenagers absolutely. are really rough <laughs> and, uh, and and so you know they're, they're they're definitely atomized and divided when they arrive they all come with their own prejudices and stereotypes and, right. and dreams and dreams right i don't want to you know, down right because that's why they're there. Right, they, right. They believe they believe enough in a better future of peace, and I'm going to call it fraternity. You know, uh, unity that that then then the current situation, uh, and it takes time because, of course, they're all steeped on you know stories and experience and a whole social system that teaches them to turn their backs to each other right? yeah do the palestinians have to keep it a secret because of the whole normalization uh move we're, we're careful with that absolutely and that that comes and goes and some years we don't have pictures of anybody's faces yeah yeah, I mean, obviously, I run into that a lot with the peacemakers. Um, yep, yep, absolutely. Um, and you know, we're just sensitive, and and we even some some part of the forms are, you know, is it okay to take a picture of mm -hmm. you know, of your child? And some yeah. parents say yes, and some people say no, and you know. Yeah. You respect that you work with it right you got to meet people where they are yeah. so all that playing that you saw and more makes them go from slowly turn from back to back to face to face yeah okay and one of the things that happens with face to face is not only you do you see the other mm -hmm. but you recognize yourself yeah of course it's you know the the way they're portrayed uh, in each world, they're not necessarily portrayed as humans, you know, yeah. even, even in uh, textbooks, uh, from what I understand, uh, uh, when they analyze uh, some of the Palestinian textbooks, that Jews are portrayed as, as dogs and, and, and animals. And so to, you know, not necessarily these kids, but if the culture is such that you're I mean, you're you're really dealing with a extreme culture uh, on, on both sides because of all the killing on both sides. And my, 
<laughs> it's, <laughs> it seems like a steep hill or, or, I mean, how do you get up that hill in 10 days? Well, it, you, you don't get up that hill in 10 days. You yeah. make a start on that hill. And yeah. that's why we don't have a one-year program. Ah. Right? That's why mm -hmm. we have a multi-year program. And yeah. That's one of the things that differentiates us from many of our very uh, honorable and rightly esteemed, esteemed sister organizations mm -hmm. tend to focus on a one and done kind of intensive camp program. Yeah. They tend to focus on 16 year olds and you go for one summer maybe two and that's it and again think about high school if you went to high school for one year what would you learn now you would have forgotten everything you learned you know a few months later right it takes reinforcement well, plus you're concentrating on other things along the no. way too <laughs> well, that's right. I mean, it takes a while to begin to climb that and, yeah. you know, we always want to remember that, you know, we're not going to take those kids up that hill. They're going to take themselves and each other up that hill. Mm -hmm. So hopefully when we're doing our work well, we are giving them the, the, the skills, the relationships, and the experience to continue that trajectory, you know, through, throughout their life, whether they become uh, diplomats or teachers or business women or whatever they decide to do that they'll you know take your non-specialist approach into their life and change how they go about it do they um have a formalized program to keep in contact with one another or well, is it they, just up to them you know so, so friendships so we keep, uh, during their four years with us and beyond, uh, we've got, you know, uh, co cohort contact groups and programming for them along the way. And then uh, in, into their being alumni and alumni sort of come and go, you know, for mm -hmm. Be there initially for the first, let's say, two or three years, and then they flake off for a while because they're in their twenties and they're mm -hmm. doing other things. And then what we found is, then they start coming back again. Then they start coming back again, and of course, they need something very different. Sure. Than the twenty-year-old, you know, a twenty-six-year-old is is different than a twenty-year-old. So absolutely, absolutely. So just to get a. Uh, a further boy here, Global Voices. Yeah, so this is Global Voices, and this takes place in New Haven, Connecticut. And, and the other is in uh, Texas, correct? Yep, the other is in Houston, Texas. The camp is just outside of Houston, Texas, and the program takes place in the camp and in downtown Houston. This is Global Voices. This takes place uh, they live in downtown New Haven, which is a uh, vibrant but gritty urban environment. It's right next door to Yale University, and Yale University is very generous to us in the use mm. of uh, uh, welcoming us to enjoy their facilities and some of their resources there. And this, this program uh, builds on identity and really wants to focus on communication. How do you communicate who you are uh, to the other, but to the world? And how do you communicate what you believe in and who you want to be? And we focus in this uh, on service to others. So you see in the center there, the welcome refugees welcome button and right below the young people are uh, helping they're taking supplies to help a refugee family move into their home and wow. yes and you know we connect this all to uh 
uh, spirituality and religious tradition and belief. Uh, so there in the lower left-hand corner, you've got three of our young people, uh, or four of our young people uh, attending synagogue. We're all there. All the rest of the of everybody's also in that photo. They're just not mm -hmm. in this uh, mm -hmm. focus. Uh, and they'll attend a, a mosque service and a church service, all, all with the themes of connecting these great Amber Abrahamic religions to serving others. You, you please God when you serve others. Uh, there's a blessing to, to the world when that takes place. And so how do we express ourselves, not just with words, yes, with words, words are important, but by mm -hmm. deeds, by deeds, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. In Christian scripture, uh, there's a, a great passage that says, you know a tree by its fruit. You know a mm -hmm. tree by its fruit. Not by what it says to you, but by its fruit, what, what it produces, what that life produces. And uh, so that's what they focus on here. They also, you can see in the corner there, uh, yeah. uh, above the, the shot from the synagogue, there's one of our uh, students teaching a young woman uh, how to uh, write English. So mm. do a lot of work with, with refugees around language, moving into their home, uh, mathematical skills, geography, uh, uh, and then those experiences that produce refugees, war, mm -hmm. violence, uh, racial hatred, uh, violence against women, mm -hmm. become the entryway where we get to do those harder dialogues about life in and between Israelis and Palestinians. So rather than saying, hey, I want to talk to you about this, mm -hmm. they, they get to experience it during the day in a very visceral way. And then we're prepared to talk about not those Iraqi or Guatemalan refugees, but about the members of the group talking to each other. And you see how that shift right there yeah so that, that's experiential learning at it right there. unfortunately with what's going on obviously today with russia and ukraine and all of the uh, refugees are are you seeing any kind of influx or anything going on as far as in your existing uh, relationships that will impact what you'll be doing with that segment of your program? Absolutely. So that, that the, the, basically the, the, the televisation of mm -hmm. the, the Russian-Ukrainian war, the Russo-Ukrainian war is bringing it home to everybody. Yes. Sensitizing everybody. Yes. And when that sensitization, when we are in New Haven this summer, probably working primarily with Afghani refugees, mm -hmm. will, uh, I think, give a sense of both urgency and energy to those conversations this summer. because It's going to be all very close to the surface. And that's mm -hmm. where... Uh, the trained facilitators who lead these dialogues is key because uh, you've got to you've got to go deep without igniting a storm. That's, yeah, that's very delicate uh, work. Well, I noted even uh, when I watch the news um, and I hear the sirens. And I hear the bombs exploding, you know, I don't think I've got PTSD, but I think I've got a little bit, you know, when you experience that, you have a visceral reaction to it, that it's the television of, the, of what's going on 
is horrid to watch, but good for teaching people getting a flavor. It's not like, you know, like when we were in bomb shelters and you, you felt even the, the bombs, uh, Iron Dome was exploding the bombs, uh, you know, way up in the sky, maybe miles away at times, but you feel the percussion against your skin and, and you don't forget that. You don't forget that. And so I'm wondering about as far as these students, um, particularly the Israelis and Palestinians who, you know, unfortunately now still are living that. And these other folks from other, from Afghan, Afghanistan, from what you're saying, um, it's a whole other level for them. It is. When you talk about these things. So I really could relate to what you're saying. And, 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 it, and it's very... Uh, the, the dialogue facilitators go through all kinds of specialized training to be able to lead this because, you know, there, you have to practice the do no harm rule, right? You don't yes. Want, you don't want to trigger someone so that, you know, that they, uh, well, that they're hurt by bringing up the topic, by remembering. Right, right. This is about helping them release it yes so they can uh better understand it what it's done to them so that others can understand how this has affected them right mm -hmm. uh, that's the other key part about dialogue dialogue is not a group negotiation mm -hmm. dialogue is hearing from one another on a a, a challenging deep question right dialogue questions are super hard to write because you don't want a yes, no answer. You know, you've got to, you know, structure the questions so people have to reveal about themselves. But, mm -hmm. uh, and it's very happened, personal. You know, what happened to me personal. is not what happened to you. Well, and, and, you and but that's exactly the point is that we're exchanging mm -hmm. and we, right. we, we understand each other and uh, we, it's a process of rehumanization, right? And once yeah. we're he both humans, then we're connected. But even people on the same side, uh, uh, people on the trip with me, nobody else was impacted like I was, you know, when we were on the trip and, and bombs were flying, they didn't understand, you know, once the bombing was over, they didn't understand why I didn't just move on, why, I, you know, couldn't drop it, why I let it change my whole life. Well, I'm glad you didn't. Uh -huh. I'm yeah. Glad. Well, I, 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 I don't believe I had a choice in that, not like I'm dragged, but that it's so real to me. It's so real and so important. It just, you know, as you and I have discussed, I just feel like this is what I'm supposed to be doing. And I let it direct me. I try not to let myself talk myself out of how could, who am I to do X, Y, Z? Who am I not to? You know, it's what I'm supposed to be doing. You know, it's just, right. It's just what I'm supposed to be doing. And uh, it's really, uh inexplicable <laughs> because I, I don't understand it. I just know in my heart, in my soul, in my direction, it is what I'm supposed to be doing. And, 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 and I want to hasten to say you're reclaiming a part of something that is integral to what is America. Because before the Second World War, really before the Cold War, everyday ordinary, ordinary Americans in vast numbers were involved in what we might call foreign relations, mm -hmm. making a difference in the greater world. Foreign policy is, of course, rightly the exclusive reserve of the government. 
but yeah. but foreign aid and relations that's 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 a, that's everybody's job that's if you're a human being that's your job part of your job yeah i you know we've talked a lot about um the various you've got a four-year program with the the kids mm -hmm. uh as I see time going on, I want to skip over to uh, the adult program, sure. Sure. Uh, the Excel Institute, for instance. Can sure. we talk about that? Because you are you are teaching teachers. <laughs> we are indeed. So that so our listeners know. You know, we we looked at the the first two years of the youth that goes mm -hmm. on for after their junior year and then their mm -hmm. senior year and the senior year is leadership and it gets them really uh, activated to uh, be able to create change at home and mm -hmm. in an effective and realistic way. Uh, so this is the Excel Teacher Training Institute. We're very proud of this. Uh, this came into being in 2019. Uh, and we do it in partnership with an organization called Rhetorica. Uh, and Dr. Ilyas Farah is the executive director of that. And Dr. Ilyas is in the photo where I am in the red shirt. He's on the <laughs> other side of the gentleman with the, mm -hmm. the, the, the peace, peace uh, picture. Mm -hmm. And uh, Dr. Elias is a very unusual man uh, with many, many skills and much history. But what he also does is he is on the faculty of the Oranim Teacher Training Program and School. Uh, in northern Israel. It's one of the schools, one of the few graduate programs where Israeli Arabs and Israeli Jews study together, right, to become teachers. Wonderful. And uh, so we run this teacher training program. How does it work quickly? It uh, works because Teachers need continuing education credits to advance in their career, but also to get a pay raise. We have put together uh, accredited curriculums in our teaching that mm -hmm. are certified by the Israeli Ministry of Education mm. so that, that these teachers can participate in our programs and get the credits and get a pay raise. Wonderful. So, so what's the goal? The goal is twofold. Well, the goal is many fold, but uh, in the short term, they uh, undergo uh, uh, a peace and recon reconciliation process themselves. They learn improved English language pedagogy skills. Mm -hmm. They are then empowered. Uh, excuse me, I had to look it up myself, but can you explain what pedagogy? <laughs> I can't even say it. Pedagogy. Pedagogy. Skills are? So, so it's how to teach English. They learn there we go. skills about <laughs> how better to teach English. There you go. Thank okay. you for, for calling me out on that. Uh, and um, So speak English, would you? <laughs> okay, I will. I'll do better next time. Uh, and uh, so they, they then begin to take the, the, those skills both the experience they had of reconciliation and the, the English language teaching skills and begin to create a combined school program. Because in Israel, we're talking about Israel proper, mm -hmm. Arabic speaking students go to different schools than Hebrew speaking students. And so this is, you know, they get out of their school and, and meet together for to have the young people start learning together. Doesn't sound like a big deal to us. Huge deal in Israel. It's a huge deal. Oh yeah. Oh and yeah, for so, sure. And then what we've learned is the, 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 the teachers that have done this, yes, they're doing that, which contributes to social healing in the country. Mm -hmm. Most of the teachers are women. These women 
get promotions because of what they've learned. So we're working on gender equality too. They start moving up the pay scale and, mm -hmm. uh, and a significant number of them with each cohort get uh, state awards for teaching excellence, which we're really proud of. And, Wonderful. And then last year, just so that we can talk about some other things, I'm sure is the mm -hmm. program from a one-time program at Cambridge University, meaning you did it one one season and you were done to yep a three level program kind of like the kids you do mm -hmm. your first level in in Jerusalem and you do an intermediate level in Nazareth and mm -hmm. then only after you've completed those two can you advance to the third level at Cambridge University very prestigious uh, intensive oh. great adventure and the plan for all this Penny is that these teachers will begin teaching the JPB curriculum, the stuff that normally we teach, mm -hmm. they'll start teaching it themselves in their schools. Wonderful. And that will allow us to have scale it up and also to have greater impact. Fabulous. Now you have so many incredible programs and I wanted to concentrate on you know a little bit deeper on some of the the teens programs because that's where it all begins and and, and builds and you have many many programs that we haven't even talked about but you also have adult programs and we begun to touch on those you have an educational travel and pilgrimages yep. segment as well. What is that about? So that is once or twice a year, Jerusalem Peace Builders leads or is contracted to lead uh, a, uh, a group of adults to uh, different parts of the Middle East. These days, that's gotten a little harder, right? Yes. Uh, but For many reasons, unfortunately. Uh, and, and we've been, we've taken people all over the Middle East. These days, we focus primarily on uh, the Holy Lands, uh, Israel, Jerusalem, Palestine, and Jordan. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Petra, and, right? And Petra. So we're, uh, yeah. so in, in, in a few weeks, I'll be taking uh, a group of women and men around Jerusalem, uh, parts of Israel and these hospitals in the West Bank. And mm -hmm. in, in October, we'll be taking a group of pilgrims, uh, primarily Christian pilgrims on a uh, both a, a, spiritual, a spiritual experience, but also an adventure uh, through Jordan, Petra, Jerash, desert castles, all these wonderful places, Karak, giant crusader castle, uh, but then also into Jerusalem as well at the end. So uh, what, what we love about this is, and it's just what happened to you, is when you go to that part of the world, mm -hmm. it changes you. Yeah. It changes and yeah. so many of these women and men become volunteers and educators and, and supporters of JPB and their lives are transformed for the better. So we're all in, we're all in on that. Yeah, I did want to mention your latest program that hasn't started yet, um, uh, that you're, you're opening for women uh, with, uh, Arij, can you uh, talk about your new program? I believe it's sure. over November. So, so the, the My Choice Women's Empowerment Program primarily, well, exclusively uh, focuses on Christian and Muslim women in the West Bank. Uh, that's because of, you know, with so many difficulties of border crossings and all permits and all of that for lots of reasons that we both understand and don't understand. Uh, we've decided to start a program in the West Bank. So it's for women. Which women? Women in their 
basically 20 somethings that we have learned through research are the most underserved community in the West Bank. So here are women in the prime of their lives. They're university educated. And they're being excluded mm. from, and sort of under, under invested in by the rest of society. We're seeking to start a leadership program. We're not just seeking, we're, we're doing it as we speak mm -hmm. uh, for women, really 20 women at a time to give them both leadership skills and a little bit of business administration education. Mm -hmm. You can relate to that. So, yep. that, so that they can, <laughs> so that they can begin to improve their lives, the lives of their family, lives of their neighborhood. It's yes, it's learn. It's that experiential learning model of learning dialogue, but then that application piece. They're all going to get onto either their neighborhood or their town or village, a community-based project. They will, we're going to get them uh, paid internships so they can get work experience and to work on that project with the idea that over time, it's a three, it's a three-year program. They will reach a certain level of success with that project which will give them the work experience they need, give them income, they'll mm -hmm. get a network, a human network going there. But also, if you're able to bring a paved road to your neighborhood, mm -hmm. or perhaps running water, or electricity, or a bus stop, it's far more likely you will also be elected to your town council. Mm -hmm. And we know in, in the West Bank, in Palestine, women are vastly underrepresented in governance and the formal economy. Oh, this, we this, want to contribute to change there. We want to contribute to change. This is different yet the same when you say I could relate to it because I grew up in corporate America during the... Uh, 70s, 80s, 90s, being one of the first female managers, et cetera, consultants, et cetera, uh, you know, through the years. So that process, that, oh, what is that? That's a woman <laughs> in, in that position, et cetera, you know, and, and unfortunately today, even in the U.S., it's still sure. so, so far behind. <laughs> was during the the Grammys I'm still laughing with the three comedians who were women who 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 began you know who were the host of the show and 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 the beginning joke was you know the reason that they were three women doing the host of the show is because they could get all three for the price of one male <laughs> and it's it's not it's not good but it really was funny <laughs> you know it's sad but funny at the same time uh, absolutely and you know that's why the you know it's a lot of the same dynamics for these women and they're going to need each other they're going to be swimming upstream uh they're going to face a lot of resistance a lot of prejudice a lot yeah. of exclusion they have a real strong cultural uh issue going on there they do and uh we want to empower them to be able to make those changes on the edges what i'm going to call positive change on the edge and you know that's why we're focusing on you know sort of the business training right their jobs mm -hmm. in the, a very high rate of unemployment in the west bank close to 30 percent but there mm -hmm. are jobs there but all the jobs, it's one of these catch-22 things. You have to have three years work experience, but no one will give you any work experience. Yeah, yeah. So that's why we want to get the most paid internships to help make that change. And, you know, I, I, I want to switch out of this to just a, a story that I think... Make it quick, though, because we're, we're running over time. Yep, well, you're going to edit me out. <laughs> 
<laughs> but okay. uh, what? what what I want to share is a story that's about the women. Mm -hmm. It's about a young man, but it's what we seek for the women and all our young people. We have a young man. Uh, he's, he's, he's an alumni now, mm -hmm. alumnus, excuse me. And he, uh, he went to the, he, he got into the Hebrew University Law Faculty, one mm -hmm. of the, if not the most difficult faculty to gain admission to. Uh, he went on to uh, do very well. He represented the state of Israel and the World Moot Court Championships that take place in Washington DC every year. He was asked to carry the Israeli flag. Mm. Doing that, he also went on to win the law prize for the state of Israel. Mm. Wow. He's not Jewish. He's actually a Palestinian Christian. I, I, I thought you'd probably get to that. <laughs> I hope so. Yeah. So, so what happened there? We invested in someone's leadership. And that allowed them to, 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 to achieve. And as he achieved, he empowered other change around him to the mm -hmm. point that he was able to break through a glass ceiling. Not even five year or five, 10 years ago would a non-Jewish person be awarded those honors, right? And here he is through his, you know, incredible humanity. Mm -hmm. He empowered others to claim their own and to say, you know what? This is the best qualified person, right? Male, female. Arab, Jew, we, we, we give the prize to the most qualified person. And that's really what we're seeking to do through everything that we're trying to do. Well, that success story sounds like a great way to end this. Uh, next week, we'll be speaking with Yehuda Stolov of Interfaith Encounters. Interfaith Encounters' main effort is forming and maintaining ongoing interfaith groups. Each group offers an opportunity to meet the other and build lasting intercommunal relations of friendship coupled with res respect for the unique identity of each. In this way, each group is a seed of the desired relations between the various communities. Their vision includes hundreds of groups, a wide variety of kinds, so that every person will have groups close to home and to heart. We hope you'll join us. And for now, we pray that everyone someday will live in peace. Shalom and salam.